Okay, hello, good afternoon. Uh, apologize for the late uh, starting. Uh, that was uh, mainly because we were attending a previous lecture of Odile Deck in the in the EdShop. So we are all together here, and it's great, Anupama, to have all these great people in the first row. Um, before presenting Anupama, maybe I would like to very quickly speak about the people here as well. Uh, we have Antonio San Martin from Etsap, Benedetta Taglabue uh, from uh, Miraye San Taglabue um, um, Architect Office, and as well uh, from the Fundación Miralles that um, they had this great initiative of the, of the project that we are all working together. Uh, Odile Deck, uh, great to see your lecture um, an, an hour ago. Uh, Ariadna Peri, Peris, Peric, Peric, from Etsap as well. Emiliano Armani, um, uh, director of the Fundación Miralles. No? Uh, did you like it? <laughs> Part of the team of the Fundación Miralles. <laughs> Beatriz Magnes as well from the Fundación Miralles. And of course, Enrico Dini, that you, you all know, faculty and collaborator of IAC. Uh, Anupama, uh, thank you very, very much for being here with us. Anupama, for the people that they are here and they are not our students. Uh, she is an architect uh, that she is coming from India. She is currently based in Australia, in Brisbane. Uh, she is working together with us uh, in the project that we will be developing in collaboration with the Fundación Miralles in the Plaza Salvador Segui, in the Filmoteca Square in, uh, in Raval in June. We will be um, making an installation of one-to-one -one there. And Anupama, she's, for the ones that they don't know, maybe I can read a bit about her. She graduated from the College of Architecture in Bombay. She began her own practice in Auroville. Uh, between 92 and 96, she worked in Berlin, focusing uh, in on social housing. Since 1996, she continued her independent practice in India, and she completed a research fellowship titled Urban Eco Community. Uh, she has worked a lot with sustainability, design and analysis. She did her PhD in, in TU Berlin. Uh, she has also wrote a manual about sustainable design, which is <laughs> here together with... Okay, with the uh, with the Institute of uh, Energy of Catalonia, very nice. So Anupama, thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you for the days that you have spent with our students, and yeah, well, uh, help me welcome her. Thank you. Uh, it's been very nice being here already the last two, three days, you know, trying to explore and start this new adventure. Thanks, Benedetta, for the invitation. And uh, I thought that uh, um, I will introduce the, my own uh, process of continuously learning architecture and uh, exploring building through this title, Building Knowledge. Um, mainly, I choose this title because uh, over the years, uh, you know, trying to be sensitive to uh, various socio-economic as well as environmental contexts in which our buildings appear and especially because this landscape is, uh, is a very shifting one and it's, uh, it's um, very unsettling because we are all facing um, a very uh, big um, uh, shortage of resources that we take for granted. So we, I, I think we will need to uh, look at things in a very new way. And I think um, rather than trying to, maybe we have to also define, redefine what we want to, to do when, as architects. And I think for my, me personally, the only good outcome is that that you are continuously learning and that every project you do, if in the end of it, uh, you know, it's not about trying to stick out of the landscape and trying to be seen. Uh, I want to say that because I want to tell my partners here in IAC that I'm not into trying to attract attention with my building and I don't want to um, stick out and it may be you will not be proud of the, that kind of, you know. Uh, no, I, I'm not saying it in a, you know, I'm, I'm just saying it up front because I think that, uh, you know, I, I prefer to, uh, to um, be able to have a process which is rich and appropriate. 
and it's not so important for me how the result looks. Of course, it is very important as an architect, you know, that it's physical and it, uh, we can, we don't, we are all aesthetically inclined and all of the ambitions that we have. But in the end, the process of uh, building knowledge, you know, uh, which, which of course, you know, is a double meaning. Uh, it's, a, it's the knowledge of building, but it's also that the verb, you know, that we leave a place and a lot of people have learned a lot of things and that is something that I am enjoying right now uh, in the process of architecture rather than the product of architecture alone. So um, I also added the subtitle approaching urgency with patience. Please don't get the wrong impression that I am very patient. I am not uh, really, uh, uh, you know, I am very restless. I have always been restless to produce a lot of things and uh, but I learned that if, in order to learn uh, to, to really learn new things there are no shortcuts it takes a lot of time and we have to do the thing you have to do to learn the thing and uh, that requires uh, a lot of patience and uh, there is a lot of urgency when you see the the landscape and especially what's happening in India and China and places like that and the kind of urbanism that is uh, going to happen in the next couple of years. I think there is a very big urgency and it's very important to not act impulsively and to act in haste and uh, it's important to take the time to learn and uh, develop the patience to be able to do that. So. Before I show some of the projects, uh, I want to show the context in which I started um, my profession and so that you understand my concerns uh, which always often come from your own um, in the scenario that in which you practice. Um, India is, um, even though I graduated from Bombay and I grew up in Bombay and I'm a a person from a mega city and you know the image you have all seen slumdog millionaire so it's that kind of background from where I come but the whole country is actually basically like this it's it's a rural the whole country is agricultural and the tendency to move to cities is accelerating but basically these nodes of uh, cities um, are partly also messy because we don't have the experience to live in cities like um, you have in Europe, you know, that there is a certain knowledge and a certain organization where even villages are somehow urban, um, you know, in, in, or, or organized in a certain urban way. But uh, India is, is, um, is basically still agricultural, even though it is rapidly transforming into things like this. I'm sorry that my pictures are also not going to be very glamorous. It's because the reality is very ugly over there and difficult. This is what it is. You have, uh, you cannot avoid this skyline. Earlier there was a certain urban form in cities and this is not only a problem of India. This is going to be the new landscape, that there is going to be a polarity between the that and that, and this is going to grow. And there's um, there is a level, there's an extreme amount of social segregation in the world, which personally it bothers me a lot. And I do take that into consideration, and I like to create um, architectural solutions where I am not further uh, manifesting this segregation or making uh, this gap wider by what I build that I easily recognize that whether this is something for the rich or for the poor or you know start having those at association with material or with form that are polarizing. So these are just some of my own concerns. This is this is the fact that uh, India, apart from the fact that the per capita consumption of anything, whether it's milk or uh, petrol or whatever it is, every, everything, even vegetables, even being vegetarian country, it, the per capita con consumption of uh, these resources is very low per Indian. But the fact is that we have lots of them. So we cannot afford to up adopt what the Western world is calling green architecture or all those kind of, uh, and, you know, new jargon, you know, that kind of standards which you may feel uh, would, what you may call efficient, it's, it's not affordable for India because it, it's, if India, if every Indian and Chinese person would build a building where you would get a green certificate for, 
we would need six or seven planets is what somebody has calculated because it's not it's not possible what what is called green here is not possible to be a universal standard in green so for us the the in india the main problem is that the 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 fact is that even if we use less it's not there's not enough resources for everybody and i hope that if we manage to find some solutions then we could set new global standards about what it what is possible to live with how little resources it's possible to live if we manage to find those solutions so i'm aiming for a much higher performance than uh, you know uh, than probably some of the global standards because i just feel that that doesn't add up you know to any improvement in our situation so this is just to give you some concerns before i begin um, that you know and all this all these new cities that are coming up in india they are being projected uh, you know because all the international companies are coming and the new sta the common standards are being launched but basically coming back to this picture you see the middle skyline is how india has been growing without planning the middle uh, thing is like the regular highways where little houses are growing with one more floor and so on slowly but on the other hand the planned development is creating a skyline like that but the way it is being conducted um, by the government and co uh, corporate partnerships is resulting in this because um, this what is happening here is happening in the major part of the world in all the places where urbanization is now happening and going to happen so given this kind of concerns and given the fact that um, despite the rich tradition of building technologies that we used to have not only in India every few m m hundred meters we have a new language we have another culture we have another costume another food uh, everything and similarly also building technologies and all of that uh, is completely rapidly being replaced by reinforced concrete which is a, is like a vernacular material now but here it it could be considered a low energy material but there it is a very uh, luxurious thing actually and it is something that we should be using judiciously saving the steel for bridges and for more important infrastructure because it is really very costly the, the, there's no energy to produce all of this we have to buy coal from australia and uh, many i mean you know we it's there's a energy crisis so all of this story is just a prologue to my work just so that to sensitize you but to be very honest i did not know all of this this is like a justification because when i began my project uh, i grew up in bombay um, this is in uh, this is in 1990 i i was 23 years old i had um, started discovering the country by traveling and i was uh, very lucky to get a project uh, to do in the outskirts somewhere and um, coming from a city i was trying to knowing a little bit about these problems i didn't want to introduce that for the just the steel bars that i would have to buy there would have to be a truck coming in there there'll be it's a, like you create all those pathways the trucks will get stuck when they bring the bricks so we'll have to pave some road and that road will become later the highway because that's how india has developed you know somebody just brings one little track everybody walks on that then the telephone lines are laid there and you know that's what i've been seeing so i i i have been taking uh, trying to do what is possible with the place in that area there were a lot of potters community and they were not able to sell their pots you know and i i thought of trying to um, you know start developing a roofing system which would uh, be would not heat up like the normal reinforced concrete roof does because when we come home usually because we don't air condition then you come home and it's very uncomfortable so um i thinking about all this i actually began at that time i must say very innocently in a you know not realizing what risks are involved in um you know but it, right from the very beginning it was a kind of a, um a practice that was developing which involved a lot of um, hands on experimentation and research and a lot of material research according to the context and i in fact found 
some old pictures of myself which I recently found out from some archives where you can say I really have no idea what this is all about. But I was trying to think of how to incorporate uh, people of the place in the building. You see what's happening in places where people, don't, we, we call them unskilled labor in India. We keep saying all these people, the whole, basically everybody has no skills. You know, but they were all living and building all their own houses throughout. We, everybody has lived in some house, you know, but now we are saying that they are all unskilled, they are all uneducated and all sorts of things. On the other hand, we don't, because they don't have the skills to build with some technologies, and then on the other hand, these potters are, are losing their livelihood. So, I thought that if they are losing the livelihood to urbanization, if we absorb them in urbanization, you know, then they will keep on uh, having, you know, producing all those things and we don't need to import it from the big cities. So I was actually just doing a lot of trial and error and testing all that and um, even though in Bombay, even in those days, we had already started with AutoCAD and everything, you know, in the offices, so it was um, already digitalized uh, some, in some places. But still I, did, I realized it was valuable to teach people uh, the first principles, you know, whether they are masons or they are going to become masons or they are learning something. It was quite interesting to start because I felt, that I was still quite young and I felt like uh, they can, they know more than me about a lot of things, you know, the masons and so on, and I felt that, you know, if we all know, exchange the knowledge like that, we will be able to control the project better. So through this, I actually built the, some of the first projects with these techniques. It was a house for a for of course a quite a rich Frenchman at that point I was not thinking about affordability and all those issues uh, because um, I was I was just telling him let me just do the roof and I'm ready to compromise on the other things you know because I had to strike a deal with him that he he trusts me because it was my first project and he was asking me from time to time have you done all this before you know which of course I hadn't done any project before so um, um, so anyway, through that, you know, I had uh, built this this first house, and um, there were many other experimental elements for myself. Like for example, these these fins were built with ferro cement, and that's a material till today I'm researching because um, now I'm I'm able to make these in two and a half centimeters, and I'm able to do lots of things. You know, and these were a lot of these experiments were begun. Um, in the very first project. So anyway, this was the very first house I did um, with um, with a lot of sensitivity, I think, to climate and the breezes and ventilation and all those issues and trying to... But of course, here you still see that my aesthetic sense was very much modernist influenced and, you know, in my... Because I, I grew up in a... I think without too much of the traditional values, we were uprooted over, you know, I, I didn't I grow up in a place where my grandparents were born, etc. So we were, you know, I, I related much more to, I think, many of the more universal, um, you know, uh, values in the, in the profession. But on the other hand, I was also struggling with some Personally, I was struggling with some of the materials or with volts or some of the forms, but I was gradually over the years surrendering to many things because of the sensitivity to the local context and, uh, you know, materials and, uh, you know, people and what they do, etc. started to creep into my architectural, um, you know, uh, I've started embracing those more and more and I think that has affected more the look of my uh, work. Meanwhile, uh, because I myself had to survive in this place, I was living in this hut. Uh, I just want to show the other students who we had discussions with. Um, you know, it was the, the house I could afford and a lot of people were also living in huts. But it was a kind of paradise life for myself because it was like Mowgli, you know, for me coming from the city, I'm like in the jungle and it was like a, you know, very adventurous time. So when I, <laughs> I lived, um, I mean, for me, it was like uh, just living very simple. I built this house, I had that motorbike. First I had a bicycle, then I had the motorbike. And I had a solar panel and I could only um, run, I had, I had uh, two lights, one up and one down. And I could use according to the battery I had put up and I, could, I had a car stereo so I had music. 
and the computer doesn't take much. So, so that was my setup, and it was astonishing. I built that. Uh, I thought it, I didn't know how long I would have stayed in this place, Oroville, in South India, and I thought that I would be. Um, just needing a temporary thing and this is what I could afford to build um, and I li landed up living here for 10 years you know I just was shocked that this materials last like that because this was untreated wood I used the wood that people use for scaffolding and never for building and I did not treat the wood because I thought I'm not going to live that long in this place and then 10 years later there were a lot of holes that insects bore but it didn't break it completely so so th that was my house it was hard to leave this house even though it was it looks much better in photos because there are no snakes there are no you know all that is not there so it looks quite good but it was still very very good time and um, progressively a lot of people who were eco fanatics and all they would come to ask me to do projects like a resort which should be no impact you know they wanted to live like for one month very ideally and go back to their normal lives or whatever so they uh, wanted to be very very pure and I would tell them this you won't be able to live like this I would ask them to compromise uh, thinking that if you really live like that you know you have to you need some more facilities but uh, you know I realized that a lot of these people actually like to have the split life you know that you have everything in one place and then you go and, and for some time you're living the other life you know but anyway so this was a project of uh, a resort by the lake and they wanted to transport some of the ideas like you know that one of the key things they wanted was what or they liked about my own hut they had come there for the meeting and that that's how it developed was that the granite pillars uh, you know they are not it's not actually meant to be used as pillars because it's very fragile it can break in shear it's the, it's not the material to be used but because it's only placed in the ground and it's not cemented it can just sway a little bit and all the joints are made of rope so it's it works for that kind of thing and it for them it also works because if you remove the structure you leave the landscape completely how it was because it's just the rope that you dismantle and everything can come down so um, in fact a lot of the explorations from then on in uh, in my office were about um, form follows technology you know this aspect of trying to find out how geometry and um, spatial uh, program would actually was it re the relationship between form and technology that would make it all optimum and is sort of indivisible um, um, like you know you c that it's all synthesized together and you can't say what uh, began uh, to to inform the other you know so so this kind of research began uh, to interest me and then there were several variations and very minute when I was saying that very subtle improvements like for example in the hut there's, there's no important technology one thing you see different here is just that to support the coconut leaves instead of having a lot of wood that they normally would use there's just some wire because in some small improvements that would really improve the clarity and the material balance between low tech and high tech because um, it's not like as if there is a clear picture about traditional systems that we say oh it's all very expensive it cannot be done in today's times it's not really like black and white there are there's always a border line up to which it becomes inefficient to use um, an old system or a com it's too expensive to use a very new modern technology so in from place to place I think you have to negotiate that exact balance how much to s sophisticated a system should be introduced like for instance how much wire I mean this much wire is introducing metal is is the economic and the sensible one for this place you know like when I use ferro cement then if I use chicken mesh it's it's uh, it makes sense and it's very cheap it's everywhere it's it's something you can buy everywhere whereas if I use steel bars it it is the same metal but it's more complex how you procure this material and everything so so a lot of those um, a lot of those uh, early projects be, uh, 
had a very high extent of ma material research which you don't easily see because the spaces were very humble and blending into the places and you know for instance here we had used um, in order not to buy industry tiles in some of the remote areas we tried to have monolithic surfaces and developed all these uh, pigments and cement floors and uh, you know uh, some of the pigments are also from natural uh, material like this is from taking the local earth and developing uh, you know uh, that as a pigment and so we developed some kind of palette of materials that can be put together from the uh, from the place easily so around um, 10 years later I, I built this house for myself after um, uh, yes I, I that I had been to Germany for some time um, Berlin and um, around 90 I don't know I forgot 96 I think I started the practice and then my the practice was like getting quite big it was about 25 people and um, and then that's when I, I started and I took a long time uh, developing this this house because I tried to uh, um, I discovered the ancient brick that of, of that region was still being remade in, in, in not remade they were, they were still in continuing to coexist beside the industrial brick and I was just trying to put my attention on that so so this house we will revisit later um, but but then uh, because I, I built it up again in the Venice uh, Biennale last year um, in full scale which I will show you later on but so this is where um, I spend uh, my time thereafter because I moved here and uh, basically in this case the program of the house was also kind of reversed in the proportion because the verandas were bigger than the built uh, blocks which were just slender 2 meter 20 kind of um, spaces uh, but because of the way in the plan uh, probably we can see that better in in plan um, you know the the very slender line it's like living inside the wall which is the protected space where the bedroom and so on are um, It's not appearing for some reason, but then, yeah. So this this is a slender linear movement. It's like a train, uh, just two, two meters um, and a bit wide. But uh, because there's the other axis, uh, which is all the openings are in that direction, somehow like the landscape is going through the raised platforms. Uh, you know, the, the overall experience of the space is neither this nor that and that's the thing which is quite hard to describe if you're not there because it's it's like um, it's um, according to the views and the openings uh, the whole space which is actually very narrow it it just feels cozy and wherever you need there are extensions of a bay window or a, a bedroom alcove or things like that because I just built this place to um, have to take care of a very tiny space if I live on my own um, and uh, if I open the doors I have the space for everybody so I don't have to have um, sofa sets to clean up in that forest area you know where maybe if there's no visitors I have to do you know if, if people come I just open the door and then I have that that was built for myself so you know this was the, what the space was about and these are the bricks that I um, I was talking about these bricks are very very ancient they are built in the most ancient technology that probably the Mohenjo-Daro and Harappan bricks were also made like that and they continue to be made in a very very uh, uh, basic way which ultimately I am interested in again uh, because probably um, you know like most of the uh, you know the developed world uh, catalogs of green buildings they talk about bricks as a highly uh, energy absorbing material and it's not sustainable as such but if you look at all the other properties of brick you know it's the most durable material uh, we've we've seen it has been lasting continuously and maybe the way we are now making them I always suspected that maybe that is what's making it unsustainable because we're trying to get everything over designed the hardest brick the strongest brick and maybe that is the brick you need for 
a certain building, but maybe it's okay if people build the the local brick with less energy, with whatever energy, whatever they have, you know, to fire coconut shells or whatever it is they were using, what we can call now uh, bio waste and, you know, benign fuels. Uh, nobody's measuring the quality of the fuel that is going into it. Nobody's measuring which kind of clay and that, that you're not mining somewhere and creating a big hole somewhere, but you're taking little bits of clay just enough to build your house. So I started appreciating that maybe it's not so bad. The brick is a very weak brick. I'm going to design for the weak brick. I'm going to make, build a thicker wall and you know maybe that is a better way to go. So, so that was the reason I was promoting this and later I thought I would share that in Venice because it's a city made of bricks. So anyway this is, this, this is that space. So I, 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 I tried a lot of different ceilings and so on. The idea here was to try to avoid as far as, I mean, to use as little steel as possible, just to check what can you do um, without that, you know. So that was the bedroom which projects out. This is the bathroom. Um, I, I actually didn't mean to have it open air, um, but, uh, but I had an idea to to build that part with bottles, with glass bottles, and I never managed to do it because I would, I, I became very busy, I didn't have the time to experiment. But later when I did this again in Venice, I thought that that part I'm going to try. That's what I did. I will show you pictures of that when it follows. But, um, but the, the toilet and the wash basin area had a roof, but this, there was a little garden I pl uh, planned to have and, you know, um, but there were there were some devices of transitional spaces that that are double height so that the space gets cooled and things like that. Um, um, so this this is the same image. You know, we will see it rebuilt in in Venice soon. So I was experimenting with a lot of systems where I was in fact like here. You know, this ceiling is a way to create a kind of coffered ceiling like a waffle slab to uh, be, the problem with a lot of efficient slabs is that the formwork is such a problem that people don't land up using it so i was working another thing i started working on for a long time is to develop formwork which are, is efficient or cheap and i thought if we use this kind of uh, fillers like a filler slab where you create voids in the concrete then it's an efficient slab and it also you can use the cheap logs of wood with which they make um, you know uh, bad concrete and then they have to plaster it instead of this you don't you use it as a kind of loss shuttering so you don't need to um, have expensive infrastructure to make a clean slab and then I started developing other uh, systems like in this case uh, you know you I use I used to use mud as a plaster to just um, uh, to, to create um, a smooth surface only so that when we wash it off later then the concrete is clean rather than relying on the shuttering to be made of metal and to be so clean so I would just have uh, you know all the bad planks and pour a very thin layer of mud and then pour the concrete so all these kind of ideas with a lot of you know trying to save anything possible because all the people around me were living in such uh, impoverished conditions you know that I, I learned to respect the value of money for, for everybody's sake and uh, at the same time try to uh, give them something so with this I did all kinds of things but you know like in my house there were many examples of roofs and there were about six or seven spanning systems were tested but they were all tested for other projects which were much larger you know like this was a community hall for a village and there was another one which I don't have I've never photographed it it was a much bigger span I think um, 15 meters span or I, I don't know maybe more 18 I think but the thing is that these slabs get more efficient as it gets bigger because that compared to the regular concrete and at the same time because the beam is contained within it then you can have you if you would have a beam at the end of your uh, thing you know of your pillars you would actually trap all the heat but because it's contained in there so it's a kind of integral solution 
that is climatic as well as structural, etc. And at, at the same time, people from the place can participate in and procure jobs, um, you know, people of knowledge and as well as people of craft and everybody can, can participate in the project. So um, these are some of the other things that we developed with, with rammed earth walls. Um, for example, you know, that you could get like concrete. I tried to transfer the aesthetic leanings I have towards those kind of materials rather than having pressed earth blocks try to build monolithic surfaces of in, in earth, which has the same aesthetic quality of concrete actually, um, you know, because you have to cast them and you have the same holes and you have the same process. It's rammed and it's very strong. It's much stronger than brick. It's stabilized with 5% uh, of cement if, if you want uh, to make it uh, more water resistant, etc. So I did a lot of very, very low cost housing with those kind of things. Really low cost housing means like uh, three to four thousand dollars, you know, like really very cheap, you know. So because there was at that time, um, uh, you know, we, because it's mostly mud and these are, these, these are just cheap bricks, you know, and then these are systems where we, where the very small houses as well, but you know, we're trying to um, um, give a, quite a, a much better alternative to the government housing. And it was very interesting for me that when there was a, a, a need for a low cost housing project, it, it turned out that the house I built for the Frenchman, the roof was in fact the most efficient way to go. And for me this, this, is, a, this, this is a thing I keep aspiring that the French person who did that house, he does not think that this is a low cost technology for the slum dwellers, you know. It's not a, it's not a question of who uses it, you know. And why should people who are rich not use something which is cost efficient, why not, you know. Because in the end, good design is about efficiency. So, uh, so why should we, you know, have the social class about for materials as well, apart from for the people. So, I mean, in, in the, it was inter it, I, I feel very happy to see more and more of these kind of structures which other people are also building. For instance, this is a bus shed, you know, in the area um, and so on. So then um, around that time, um, there were, like, this is the place Oroville, you know, where I built um, uh, many of my projects because that's where I was living. And there was a city in the making that was planned here, an international city, but all the trees that you see were also planted by the people. It was a barren land. In a matter of 25 years, they had managed to transform the landscape into a forest. Um, it is a, a the pro chief architect appointed for that project was Roger Angers, about whom I had written a book uh, in 2008. It was published about his, his projects uh, in Paris as well as in India. But in that context, um, where urban, uh, the, there is an urban um, project planned there and the housing that is being envisaged here for instance, was it was this project was called a urban eco community because whatever um, ideas actually I did not mention in all the previous projects there was a lot of kind of um, green infrastructure like in the water energy and all of that but in this kind of projects all of that could ach achieve a much more kind of uh, collective um, kind of uh, experimentation, you know, where we didn't go, like for instance, all the water from the toilets are being cleaned and reused and all that, or, or that the electricity is managed with solar and uh, electricity hybrid. But everywhere I realized, not only in the technology, I was all the time finding hybrid solutions, even between different sources of water and different sources of energy, because the black and white option is usually the one which is putting a too much stress on the on the whole system and uh, to, to define the extent you use of each thing and design a system that will like for example if you have different plumbing lines for the different water uh, etc or for the same with the electricity um, to have a way to monitor and uh, match the use of different sources so more more and more of those ideas got incorporated and again here you see the project is not entirely built with rammed earth but 
but all the ground floor is and that is because we needed to excavate a certain amount of earth for doing the wastewater treatment plant and that amount of earth gave me this much wall I, and also because the community did not trust me to go higher I must admit frankly they were not going for it you know but and uh, I, I mean they, they said okay 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 but when they actually saw the thing they were a bit you know like not sure but anyway at least we managed the ground floor for that project um, and it's okay step by step that's why I said I learned to be more patient so and then in, even in this kind of systems uh, it's like a f three floors you know that there are little devices that suck the air simple devices in the end because nobody was able to afford the more sophisticated ones so you know integrating the like the roof separating its function for only pro bring, uh, protecting from uh, rain and having other things to protect from sun like this kind of walkways and having streets on the upper level so that it's a low cost housing project too but then you don't have dark staircases and passages and you just you know distribute everything through uh, pleasant spaces so these are the kind of uh, you know things that I produced eventually that terracotta thing it kept on spreading on onto many projects and so at least the potters community are happy with me so but talking about terracotta one more time about clay one of the more radical things that I have done in uh, terms of a risk or experimentation is a project and then I did my PhD on it much later is about um, um, a, a, a Californian ceramist, Ray Meeker, who had had the bizarre idea to build mud houses and fire them in situ. Instead of, it's like crazy, but I was attracted always to these people who have so much and uh, you know, uh, you know, spirit of adventure and are patiently working on it for years. So over 20 years, he has uh, resolved the idea of building houses with mud, sticking the joint with mud, cooking it from inside. It sounds very simple in a way, even though it sounds crazy, but it is very difficult because. Um, you know, of course, to, in, to cook even a large pot is very difficult, not only because it cracks, but because it requires, it takes a lot of space in the kiln and all of that. But if you look at it from an environmental point of view, the house, the kiln, uh, t let's look at the house, as, uh, let's look at a kiln. A kiln ab uh, absorbs 40% of the heat. Whenever you make bricks or something, you, you know, 40% of the heat that you generate goes into the wall of the brick. Again and again it's going for nothing, all that energy into a baked wall. So if you were to build the house, think of it in that way, that if you build a house or build a kiln with mud bricks, fill it with products you anyway want to cook, then you set fire to it and cook it, take your products and you have burnt your house for free. If you manage to cook the whole thickness, which is took 20 years. but. Um, the thing is, this, this, so I had been following his work as well as some other people doing very crazy research. So I, I did my PhD related to that. But I also had built, before the PhD, I had done a few houses in this technology. I unfortunately don't have a lot of my things I were not archived. Um, I didn't realize I will become known. At that point, I was fully there in the with the mud and well, you know there was it was all very messy to keep anything clean and to have slides and lots of things have got destroyed but uh, that's why I building knowledge is like the knowledge remains you know so anyway so this kind of system has some advantages for me because like in my thinking because you know instead of taking the brick to the building uh, to the manufacturing unit if the fire is taken to the site, you know, it's not a big thing to get fire. Every house has fire. Every household has fire. You know, but the socio-economic implication is huge because there is no transportation of materials. There is no other material being used. All the material is, all the money spent on 100% labor. If somebody steals anything, it's worth nothing because the making the earth is from there you know you make it if some in a poor place they always you know the the contractor cannot do any corruption with the steel he doesn't add because 
whatever is made is only ma like if you take it away there's no value so no it was it had so many advantages and energy wise also we found out that it had a lot of advantages and so this 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 is what that californian potter was building like huge things but i was interested in this concept to see the house as a producer of building materials and things rather than a consumer so we were making tiles toilet pans wash basins anything and the the idea to do all that and provide your neighbors with building materials uh, because you've done somebody's house and because all these local potters by the way, Ray was doing this experiment. I was giving, I was going on making products because he needs products to fill inside the house. So I was creating a kind of terracotta market for the whole thing so that our research could go on. And um, eventually, you know, later I did, I mean, and now I'm slowly moving to what the student engagement in all our projects is that because so many people from many schools had, were coming to learn at that time I was not ready to go out so much for teaching but I was receiving people in my place and organizing with institutes that they can learn there so like here what they are doing is they are using this as a form work for making windows so they are using you know we are trying to find cheaper ways of doing things so um, for in four weeks we were building this kind of orphanage um, kind of um, prototypes for, for the children to, li to uh, you know, live here with foster parents. And as you see, there's a lot of material that has to be s stacked here. It's a very exciting project. Uh, if for three or four days, it's like burning. So everybody who was saying, you know, about fire regulations and everybody's immediately afraid, you know, to do when you think, oh, fire, because of all the fire, they think of fire as a problem. No, but it's transforming everything, you know, and, and we don't need cement or anything and the house will never melt away, you know. So, um, it's like baking a cake actually, you don't know the exact formula, but you have to try out because it depends a bit on the clay and everything. But then you take out all this, um, you take out these bricks and you can use it for finishing other things in the landscape and all that. Or you can sell them and recover the whole house cost, you know, because you get quite a lot of money from selling those products. 75% of the clay goes into making products and 25 on the house. And that's why it's very crazy to do this and to mainstream this kind of thing. But um, anyway, it's still intriguing me. And this was the, that project. We have to do very efficient forms for all this kind of, because the structure has to withstand fire and when the steam is coming out it's going to be damp so it has to withstand many many tests in the different stages. But, um, but then a lot of those kind of, you know, then besides work, you know, a lot of these uh, kind of, you know, using waste into buildings but going to places, finding out what they have and reusing them, you know, for example, that for that same orphanage, the whole bathroom block is made with bottles because it's standing in the rain and it's a wet space. So uh, it's made by, you know, not a good message to give with beer bottles, but, um, but this, the part of the roof was made with chai cups because it's also for me quite whenever I after working in the rural area I would go to buy a glass block and you find out the price and you say forget it I'm going to buy this glass you know it's shocking how much building materials cost compared to other mat the materials if you source them from the other domestic sector so I was often sourcing products from finding the same function and just finding uh, you know using using other things for building so I think I'm just going to now, I wanted to actually show some, like this is when I taught um, at the AA, we had done a, a workshop, I think I'm going to skip this explanation, but you know, basically they, this is a project in Hook Park, uh, which the AA had acquired, and the students who were designing in this area, I was trying to talk about how from this apparently linear forest, where you think all the wood is straight, you know, Andy Goldsworthy had made in the same place a nest, you know. And uh, so I was, I was provoking them to think about how the form is derived from material and uh, so on. But I had taken them to uh, India for a 10-day workshop 
uh, where they had to design a watchtower in the botanical garden. Um, they had to d design and make it only with the toolbox of 1 to 50 scale of products we had given them. And, uh, they, and they were, of course, they could draw and all that. But it was very much hands-on. And then finally, this is what what they built, and uh, you know, with, with assistance. Because, you know, the thing is, there's a lot of hands-on uh, building uh, workshops happening, uh, which um, which are like uh, design build studios. I have been to many of those type of uh, you know situations. I am not so in favor of students just coming and building and all that without designing or learning about reflecting about design. You know the, because they go to some social places and they are helping. And of course, there's a lot of learning. But for me, it's very important that they are assisted with others who build much better than they are going to learn. They are not here to learn that thing. You know, they are uh, there to... Uh, for me, they are, they, they, I want what I want to do by giving them this experience is that I want them to be able to think in the same scale, like every artist is thinking in the same scale. You know, and for us, sometimes when we make models in another scale, um, uh, students sometimes don't know that object in the real scale and the material behavior in the real scale or when they design a color pattern what impact it will have in real scale and I want them to be able to uh, operate in real scale with real people with real sight and all the real things you know and have that exposure and it, it can sometimes be had in a very very short uh, time like for example they built all this design and build in 10 days you know and um, Anyway, so similarly, this is a this is a workshop where we are doing uh, exploring ferro cement, which is something I'm still continuing to work. You know, so there's a lot of material research that I uh, started including in uh, in in teaching and in practice. And uh, here I'm going to just show you a bit of the Venice project that when I w when David Chipperfield asked me to respond to the theme of common ground last year i i was reminded or by the pictures of venice i was reminded of my the same brick that 20 years ago i had explored behind the peeling plaster because it was an ancient brick and everywhere in venice i had this image that when you look at the different places that you see the history through the different patchwork of bricks of a different time where people have added something or the other and the whole thing is a brick city I, and I thought it would be amazing to because I do believe that architecture is a very site specific thing and I, re, I believe more in the Uncommon Ground uh, book of David Leatherbarrow you know about that and I wanted to respond to common ground by taking something which would look completely like it doesn't belong there that I purely take no material from Italy I take everything from India every pebble and every stone and every brick and it's obviously not from there and that I will make it look like it belongs there you know because in the end we can transcend all that because I think we are all not that different anyway I think so that was my idea so in the space that was given I uh, thought of installing the wall house uh, here because um, I also was reacting to the way we are representing architecture and I wanted to I wanted to make the point that if you don't inhabit spaces then who knows how you're perceiving what is shown you know and I, I wanted to make it architecture is a real thing so it comes with the practicality along with the high aspiring ideas it's it comes down to brick and mortar and everything so with this I uh, sort of thought of taking the timelessness of brick as a thing to not take for granted and to uh, I got all of this again documented and revisited how bricks are made and fired in in ancient times and how that they that it is actually a very benign material compared to like now the bricks in that you buy in Italy like what we, they were buying for in Venice were so alien to their own own architecture that they have there so I thought it would be great to take a foreign one and see whether it belongs better and uh, so yeah we got all these things made so the whole production for Venice was a lot of people were involved everything was being made and I got the chance to document all the things that I had lost in my sl <laughs> in my over the years so I have photos again um, 
So as you see, these are all fired by very simple things which are waste, you know, and um, I wanted to make people aware. These are the community of people who make lime, just like the lime that was used in Venice. These kind of communities are, you know, when we just specify Portland cement, without thinking you displace a whole, you can displace a complete community because they don't know anything else to do anything else. And that's what it is, you know. So anyway, this is all that kind of thing. Uh, then it was also very crazy in terms of, you know, like talking about building knowledge again and the cultural diversity. I thought let's find out the common ground if it exists or not between engineers, between people who have to translate everything into a building. So there's the Italians, Australians, um, you know, this craftsmen, some people who have never even gone to another city in India. So it was the most difficult thing in the Venice Biennale project was the visa for the Indians <laughs> and next difficult was the custom clearance of our mud and all that looks very suspicious um, we also tried to design it in a manner that the Australian students uh, and the Venetian students I mean basically people who've not ever built anything we should be able to build it in a manner that all types of people can participate, sophisticated ones as well as people, you know, there should be, it, all the decisions should be realizable by everyone and, and of course the most complicated part of the design is something which nobody would have seen, it's the spreader system that allows the load to be taken in a very sensitive building with very little uh, weight, uh, you know, you are not, we were given very conservative weight uh, restrictions for the building. So anyway, all this material I spoke about, you see, every rock and things are coming from there, three containers, three big containers of materials, and the, and the people who've, who've never been out of their place, they are very, uh, like, craftsmen. Those are the people who had, some of them are the ones who built my own house, and now they are very hard to get, they are, uh, because they have become craftsmen and, you know, they were just assistants before in, in this place. So, it was very interesting. You see here, these are the bricks, these are the bricks we, we bought for the under area. So, um, and they are so alien to its own brick, you know, and then, but still the building process seemed throughout that it just fits over there in that space. And I was uh, strongly trying to make this point that we actually, if you establish the unity, if you establish what is common very strongly, then the diversity can be celebrated. But if you just don't uh, try to find the what you anyway relate and what, you know, if you don't find that platform, first then then you know you the same thing may be a disaster so this was the group of people they were given different t-shirts not to segregate them it was for because the terrible differences of laws between countries of whose which students insurance is allowed to let them touch which machine and all that. Australia is terrible and all this. But in the end, it doesn't make sense because like footballers, they were exchanging their t-shirts. So we, we thought we can control them, you know. But it, was, it wasn't really, uh, really working. So, you know, the t-shirts, you know. But it was very difficult. There was no common language except the building language. See, all the things are built here. But the most uh, important thing is that the engineers were not agreeing to what, because of their laws, of what is allowed. And the thing is, we already built all of this, in, and they were, I was telling them the same gravity acts on all the places, if for God's sake, it must stand, if it has stood there. But it was impossible to, because their codes don't allow them to do different things. So the, the roof that I didn't manage to do with the wine bottles, I, I think I wasn't drinking enough in India. I didn't collect enough material. <laughs> so anyway, we we did this, you know, this kind of uh, thing. It, it it's not it was not built. It's not an easy matter because it's not easy to cut glass, but it's not it's not difficult. Um, so we did those top type of experiments, and finally on the floor, I tried to merge. You know, I collected. I wanted to have the common ground made with the material of both places and the only material I used from Venice was the crumbs of the broken brick rubble that I found from the pillars. I found them in the areas that all the ruins. I collected them and I used them because I, I needed material for the landscaping of that area. And so I was uh, laying out 
those, those things and making the landscape the common ground to show that the ground is an important thing in common ground and that it's an uneven ground and uh, you know showing it with the texture of all those things but uh, the final installation you know it does it does fit at least for me you know that the building um, the there was a common ground that was established between the brickwork of that place between the ancient between the new between um, the Italian and the, the Indian, between, you know, all those things. Um, and um, the, just for the sake of, for theatrical reasons, I had bought my dining table from my house. Also, I like the dining table because it was designed out of one log and no other material. Everything is interlocked by wood. And so I brought that here so that we could have one dinner, you know, with everybody. Um, uh, or just for the opening, so that was yeah. We did everything, including the the water body and everything. We also kept. I also wanted to not finish everything because I didn't want to put up any posters, panels, and people can understand everything, just to the extent they want. Just like you visit architecture, I didn't want to burden people with information. But I thought that a building that is in ruin which is incomplete, like this is not, the brickwork is only seen because the plaster is cracking and peeling. So we know how it's constructed because it's an architecture in ruin. So if I build an unfinished architecture with the architecture in ruin, then you understand how both are made and there is some commonality to, and we approach uh, everything about common ground through the making um, and, and just uh, realize that we are all building upon the findings of each other over generations so it's no, nobody, it's all, all the inventions are actually part of uh, that. There were just some films of other people who had documented, uh, like for example, Harun Faroqi had documented some of this, um, some of my work along with other people where he had, uh, he had uh, made a film on brick, it was called In Comparison. He used the making of a single brick to compare socio-economic realities between Africa India, Switzerland, the, the robotic uh, thing is also there and the sounds and you know the squeaky sounds of the, that place where this house is being built compared to the music that someone's playing and he compared gender issues and everything by watching only how one brick is being made in different places so uh, you know people like that with whom I crossed roads I had showed those films to expand the knowledge of of um, the building and there was only one room where the person who documented our things uh, his time lapse and uh, you know work was Andreas Defler okay I think I'm going to it's uh, quite long I just want to go quickly to this thing because now I'm trying to work with form work again and I'm trying to work on a project for affordable housing where this kind of uh, where paper corrugated paper can be the form work for ferro cement so i'm it's called this project is called light matters and i'm trying to go for uh, uh, you know the idea is that you can um, wait a uh, fold just a moment Ca you can carry this you go to the site you open it into that form and then you have the mesh also folded in this triangulation but there's no wastage because these are all strips of paper and the triangulation is just giving rigidity and al allowing us to carry it open it and plaster it and that's the house so I've just uh, you know I'm working on that system now all this has expanded onto furniture curtains and all sorts of things okay this is, this is the last two or three slides is about what we are going to do here which we don't know yet but we we it's called the library of lost books that's the that's what we were given as a starting point um, I'm thinking of calling it books unbound because the theme is liberty so I'm thinking of trying to um, build because every city has got a major problem in how to get rid of books Bo the books are going to disappear in this form it would probably still remain and be more expensive and have fewer copies but everything is going digital but I'm thinking that if the books I would like to project the future loss of books 
rather than the past and I would like I, I started seeing that you know to, to get a sense of what is happening to books and how publishing houses have to dump books because it's a big problem what to do with all the books that nobody wants so I'm trying to adopt these unwanted books and try to you see what we can build with that so that we again uh, try to not spend money on the material and try to rather spend it on the labor and on the people, um, the whatever uh, we have. But on the other hand, I'm also feel I, I feel bad, you know, when the, we are doing all this because it it hurts me to damage the book. It's it's difficult for me to actually do this. So I'm I'm feeling more like while I do this, I also want to allow people to browse and exchange and take books maybe in this place and maybe the program of the building could become something like a free exchange of books so people can come if they want to get rid of books there are shelves where they can dump books other people can come and take books there's no worry to steal anything because we want to get rid of the books anyway so you know this these are the ideas with which um, some there, there has been some work um, that we did in uh, UQ and there are uh, there is a whole new thing you can do with telephone books and uh, uh, yellow pages and all that for books where you know uh, you definitely don't have another use to read the written word in it so that those there are things you can you can be doing um, but basically Again, I'm thinking of, um, you know, um, bringing books to um, an area, a neighborhood where, with, with social difficulties. Maybe it is quite good to have this uh, topic, you know, again, uh, building knowledge. It's a way of, you know, through, through knowledge you can become free. You know, you don't maybe have to do, uh, you can maybe def redefine what to do. You know, the knowledge is probably the best thing to invest in and uh, the best thing to spread you know to bring uh, books as a symbol not only of them being unwanted to show people in our society to face the fact that we nobody wants books anymore but on the other hand to also bring books as a way to liberate uh, people and to uh, allow people to speak freely you know and get rid of the suppression. Okay, so with that I end the, the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anupama. Questions for Anupama? Okay, so I, I can make a question and then m maybe I warm up the spirit or else we can have a drink and we can speak a bit more informally. But um, it's great to see the coherence of, um, of the way of thinking behind sustainability, not only in terms of materiality and real cost, but also in terms of um, efficiency and sustainability in social communities, in specific case studies and context. I think this kind of sensibility is something that um, uh, personally I admire a lot. Um, it, it's something that it's, it's really rooted on, 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 on the way, on the environment somebody has been grown up as well. And that's very, very important. Um, and when it comes to sustainability, I am trying to think that um, it's great when we start thinking of alternative solutions or cheap solutions uh, or working with the raw material that we can find on site in, con in different contexts of maybe India or rural areas or the forest or the jungle. But when it comes to the city and when it comes to the urban environment, uh, I'm starting of thinking what kind of materials, what kind of uh, uh, raw matter we could use in order to start thinking of 
sustainable systems in terms of building material but in terms of performance as well so I would like your opinion of what would what should um, um, as architects try to think when it comes to uh, build in in dense urban environments as the cities of today mega cities or like high dense cities in a way I I, I just, um, I don't want to claim to have any formula for anything or to be able to solve anything, okay? But uh, I can say what I'm thinking because I also actually grew up in the mega city. I'm, uh, you know, all the time thinking a lot of things I did in a rural area were with the, because they don't worry about it. But I worry because I think if everybody does this, you know, because I'm thinking of that landscape which I know. but. Um, uh, one of the things that I think about when I think about Bombay or play bigger, bigger cities or even here, you know, I think one thing is that we are not contacting the waste that we produce, you know, because we just, it goes somewhere. We don't know where it goes and so we, because we don't have the quantity and we don't measure it, we don't know what it is, how bad is it or, or not. So I think for me nowadays, uh, I, I do like to look at what waste is being produced in any context and because that is a big problem because after I was teaching urban management in Berlin I really came to know the facts and figures of the infrastructure problem of cities and I think I I think it's a big problem for the municipalities to process the waste that we produce so first thing I look at what can I make with the what they are calling waste you know, that's the first thing. And in urban areas, you have that maximum resource you have is the waste, you know, urban waste. And I think uh, in that sense, even the book comes somehow in that, unfortunately, in that bracket. Um, but I think uh, be beyond that, I think a lot of efficiencies. Other than that, I think uh, um, I don't like to impose only the inventing of new materials, but I think it's good to think also about old materials in new ways rather than only thinking for the new, like a longing, like a, like a kind of ad automatic addiction for the next thing, the next thing. And I think it is quite calming for me to think about rethink some old materials because sometimes the combination did not work to prolong its life, but if you rethink it and replace the some small difference in the whole thing because those are lasting systems which did not create such big problems like we have you know now so um, I, I would um, I mean I, I must say also this green is not a, like a religious thing for me so for some people it is you know and for me it is not like that it's just that I am seeking an efficiency you know and if I can uh, use something that there is abundance of like waste for instance I, I am thinking all the time what can we do to um, absorb it into the building. So that is one of the key things. Otherwise I think if things are well climatically designed and like any good architect would do, then we continue with that. I don't think, uh, I don't think, I don't like this green architect thing, you know. I think a, a good architect is automatically doing, taking care of everything, you know. And so it's much better than someone who's only taking care of the green thing and not of everything else an architect is supposed to do. So I don't like to use the word sustainability in that way, you know. Um, I was just wondering, are you talking about um Sorry, uh, seeking efficiency and reducing waste. Um, can you recall a point where you were inspired to follow that sort of direction with your design, or was it a natural um, path that you followed? No, it's, it was. It's never natural because uh, it's like a just b humbling experience <laughs> to come down when your budget is not permitting this or your local situation. I don't think. Uh, I grew into this by just knowing more and that's why I'm stressing on the building knowledge approach because the more you know then it affects your even your aesthetic sense almost like if you know somebody you find them very beautiful and when you find out how terrible they may be then you don't find them beautiful anymore so it's like that somehow that knowledge it also influences uh, what you like and what you don't like, you know, slowly it creeps into you.
and then you find yourself suggesting for me it was a gradual thing it was not like I started out with those values it's something I have accumulated a sensitivity for very gradually over the years I still have to strain I have uh, ideas and I feel okay this and that doesn't make sense or it is wasteful or or something is not working out and you have to rethink and then I I'm developing this way slowly by you know confronting every day other people struggling with means you know so I don't like to be frivolous with with design I feel we you know like uh, Eames had said you know that there's so many real problems to be solved you don't have to do innovation just for its own sake there's so much to or solve that requires design solving so I'm more in in that bent yeah Um, I guess my question is kind of in the same vein. Um, I really like what you said about um, the design build process and the way that it's changed when it's on site uh, using local processes and local knowledge. Uh, and from my own experience uh, in design build, it's often what you described as we have a, a program, we have uh, some wood, and how do we make it into a building? It's, it's very much uh, uh, a bit prescribed from the beginning. And I'm wondering in, in the curriculum or the academic process if you've seen any real examples of how to shift that, uh, that process to something that's more uh, working, working on the process as opposed to working on the product. I think that even if you are given to take, uh, uh, if your exercise is to take wood and see what you can do with it, it's the same thing, it's still about the process. Because if you learn one process properly and you go to another context, uh, you know, and you'll pick a material, you will know what to do with it. So I don't think, I think the method that you're doing is going to lead to that. I don't know if you are convinced or not. But I think because otherwise you're always escaping, you know no matter which situation you're in, you are going to be given a material. Now it's given to you by a teacher or a course, but I mean, if I go to this place, I am given this terracotta and then I have to think what to do with it, you know? So it's, it's the same surrender, it's not your choice, you know? It's, this is what this place has and what can I do with it, you know? That's what I would see, say. Yeah, we should close. Yeah, is that? Thank you very much. Thank you.